Hey, good morning to my friends out there and also to good morning to Kevin and Roseanne, my colleagues, and trying to actually um, do the impossible, the moonshot, as Kevin likes to call it. It's uh, Monday, January 29th, 2024 at 11 a.m. Uh, Mountain Time. And um, I don't know about you guys, but I am uh, recovering from yesterday's playoff games, which were, um, you know, pretty amazing. And I was thinking about this this morning from this, the standpoint that, um, you know, this was one of the craziest football seasons we've ever had. It was strange uh, just when you kind of got a sense of like who was in charge and had the momentum and who was the front runners, then they'd lose three games in a row. And things were strange. But inevitably, we wind up with pretty much the four best teams in the uh, championship games yesterday. And the Ravens and Lamar Jackson found every way to blow it at just the right moment. And um, Kansas City uh, seems to have the magic touch, as they have, I think, are we now six visits to the Super Bowl and said so many years. And then, of course, San Francisco and Detroit battled it out. Detroit had everybody was a fan favorite because the city of grit and the rest of it. But boy, San Francisco um, grounded out with Purdy delivering when he needed to. And of course, the offensive line of the 49ers. But my point of all of that is that if this were the equivalent of the presidency and it was, you know, parallel, we wouldn't have Biden or Trump in the, you know, the, the, the race. They, they, they wouldn't be the best the country had to offer based on the way the game is supposed to be played. And therein lies everything that we should understand and resonate to what we're trying to create in terms of a, a campaign, a massive uh, populist tidal wave crusade. And I know a lot of people get a little nervous with that language, but you've got to think this way because nobody else is going to have the momentum, the power, um, the objective uh, to do so if you don't think in terms of what is actually on display here. Now, many people that are blue, no matter who, are going to tell you this is a vote about democracy to save democracy. We all know that we haven't been a democracy for a very long time which is a joke, to be quite frank with you. It's just simply the lesser of two evils approach. And Kevin, you happen to write um, a fantastic expose that you shared on your your, your podcast website, uh, Onward at Last. Um, I would encourage people to check it out. But I think we're going to start the conversation with you, Kevin, because I'd like you to lay out sort of the primers of how you're looking at what the realities of the moment are, and ultimately what we are uh, attempting to achieve as an uh, as a contrast, as an alternative to uh, to to what we all know is is true. While everybody else is going to talk about things like, you know, um, uh, boy, who who was our favorite outsider? That uh, of course everybody, Ralph Nader, blamed the loss of Gore and blah blah blah. And look, democracy is supposed to be democracy. And it's ironic that the Democratic Party wants to argue for democracy while at the same time quashing democracy on their side of the fence. And we can have a lot of nuanced conversation about a lot of the details that you lay out, but we have to have a platform and we have to lay out what a lot of people are thinking. And we have to be able to get to the magnitude of the moment, because on top of what you just read, Roseanne, we have, I have laid out five truth bombs in a row that also frame a lot of realities that millions of people are not getting wind of and do not understand. And I hope your eyes are okay. So on that note, Kevin, let's, let's tee you up to uh, kind of walk through your, your latest piece and, and what it means and how you see the big picture. Yeah. Thank you so much, Patrick. I'm so glad to be here with you and Roseanne this morning and with everyone who's watching. Um, yeah. I wrote uh, um, my latest commentary um, is called America's last stand. And it really speaks to what we face here in 2024. You know, as as we as we turn as Americans to the 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 what the quadrennial exercise of deciding who's going to be the next president, we find ourselves in quite the pulp fiction. We find ourselves in the most bizarre situation because unlike the the two contestants in the Super Bowl coming up. We have the, the the likely contest that we're being spoon fed, or I, or I should say that's being forced down our throats, is the contest that most of the country doesn't want, which is which is the idea of having two of the least popular presidents in U.S. history. Now let that steep in for a sec. Two of the least popular presidents in U.S. history 
facing each other in a re rematch. Both both of which are at or beyond, you know, 80 years old. Both of which are clearly past in their own ways, one way or another, past their peak, even though uh, you know, one may be a little bit more competent than the other in terms of cognizant capabilities, right? But here we are. We're being forced. No matter what we try to do as people, we're being forced to accept this is our choice. This is what the American experiment has been reduced to. This is supposed to be the notion of democracy and the way we practice it as Americans, democratic republic, the way we practice it as, as Americans is that the sovereignty rests in the people. But once, it, but what, what this choice is laying out here before us is the fact that the American experiment has been broken, right? The sovereignty no longer rests in the people. Over and over and over and over again, we have polling data that captures how the American people feel about a variety of issues that impact their lives. None of these issues are explaining the choices that we have. None of these issues are explaining what our government is doing, right? So the question, so 22, I, I wrote this commentary on America's last name because we've reached the moment where we either take back our, our, our sovereignty or we acknowledge that we've lost it forever, right? And, and, and so the commentary just challenges the reader to look at the situation we're in. Now, all of us would much rather just say, okay, it's, it's, it's a clown show and just go on with our lives. But we know we can't do that. Why? Well, because what they have been doing in power, what they've been doing in government is progressively impacting our lives, progressively denying us the capability of just ignoring the clown show and just trying to build lives on our own. So therefore, therefore we have no other choice but to address the, the elephant in the room and and to make sure that this is going to reflect our will and not the will of 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 the puppet masters of of the wealthy elites who clearly this must serve because it doesn't serve us and so so yeah I I in this commentary I basically say yes here are the two choices here are why these two choices are not do cannot meet this moment because what is this moment? We have existential challenges being manufactured as we speak. We have we we are facing a genuine climate crisis. If if you know the the our our availability of fresh water here in the United States is profoundly impacted. You know, our ability to grow food is profoundly impacted by the climate crisis. Let alone the risk of various types of extreme weather events, you know, that we're dealing with. Okay, so this is a crisis that we have to deal with, and we are running out of time to deal with it in a way that would avoid the worst irreversible impacts, such as the melting of the Greenland ice cap. Don't want to get too deep in the weeds, but the bottom line is, if we if we can't stop the melting of the Greenland ice cap, and we're getting to the tipping point where we won't be able to stop it it will change the shape of the continents of this planet because it will raise sea level eight meters, which will destroy every coastal city on this planet over the next hundred years. So we have crises that will determine whether our children and their children and their children will be able to enjoy the world like we do, okay? we are. But at the same time that we have that crisis, we are making up geopolitical conflicts that boggle the mind. While we should be focusing on climate and how to fix that problem, right? We're here trying to fight wars, you know, the United States versus Russia and Ukraine, the United States versus Iran you know, over Gaza, you know, over, over Israeli policy in Gaza. You know, the, the, you know, the, we are teeing up a war with China over Taiwan. It's as if we, we have lost the powers that be want to engage in that, right? Most of us don't, right? The, we have we have to seize our sovereignty so that we can redirect what our country is doing with our dollars on our behalf. Okay, and so this is what the commentary leads us to. It's not going to be Biden 
who's 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 completely running us off the rails, right? It's not going to be Trump, right? Who again he has done what Trump always does: perfect an image to sell himself. He is the anti-establishment, right? Because everyone in the establishment can't stand Trump. So every time Trump speaks. Every time Trump does anything, the entire establishment, you know, from from the Republican establishment to the Democratic establishment, head explodes. OK, people who support him love that. He has framed himself in that way perfectly. But what he hasn't done is change the, the multi-trillion dollar extraction of wealth and resources from working people up to the top one percent. It's only gotten worse when he was in control. Right. And that, and I point that out here. So he's not going to be the person that's going to solve our problems, our challenges. Right. And, tr and Biden is not the person. So what are we going to do? We need to think out the box. They have the money. They own the media. They, they own both establishment political parties. Our area of movement is in the independents and third parties. And what we have to do is we have to encourage those people to coalesce, to get together, because most of the American public would prefer an alternative. If we give them a credible alternative and we bring them together with a unifying agenda, we can take control back of our country, reclaim our sovereignty, and actually start investing in rebuilding the America of our dreams, right? And, and so, so this is what I talk about in America's Last Stand, because we can do this, right? And, and that unifying agenda is the Clean New Deal. So I'm going to stop there, because I know we're going to talk a great deal about what the Clean New Deal is. But I address it in the commentary, and I do suggest people take a look at it at www.onwardatlast.com. The commentary is called America's Last Stand. But yes, so that's what that's all about, Patrick. Well, I think that was a that was a fantastic introduction to it, and I appreciate the um, the broad based approach, particularly. Um, you know, I'm going to toss a T rose in, in in just a moment, but I, I have to ask you, like the pressing the pressing question that I found myself asking as you were laying that out is, who is they? They is you mean the powers that be? They who that you're talking? We're talking about the point point the point zero zero one percent those who are behind the curtain, those who are own the media. So for example, there's only three or four entities that own 95% of all securities on the S&P 500, right? Th that's the day. You know, the powers that be that control the narrative, that, that, con that own our politicians, that, you know, where, where we can't do anything, anything that we want as the American people is dead on arrival because those people control work for yeah, and, and the irony of ironies is Trump is one of those people, <laughs> right? You know, and, and he's admitted it openly. He said, all these people, all these politicians, they take my calls. They work because you know what? Because when they need money, I give them money. So they call, they take my calls. Well, this is the this is the problem. You know, we they don't take our calls. So that's who the they is. Vested I think that was that was very well said. Um I will I will further that and I'm gonna kind of tee you up here, Roseanne to go into your introspection um, but everything is connected um there's always a uh, an extrapolation uh to your point kevin particularly as it relates to the climate crisis now the disconnect of course is a lot of people aren't in the agricultural business themselves they don't understand the technology or the science of growing or the cycles or they don't understand weather uh they don't understand you know, the nature of climate period. I mean, even on an elementary level basis, let alone what you're talking about, specifically if you're projecting out a hundred years. And I, I run into that all the time where it's like, most people are like, well, I'm going to get mine now and good luck to the rest. Right. And that goes for the people on the upper, upper, upper echelons of this whole story. Right. They've got the capacity to understand it. They don't care because they're making their dime off of what this whole system is, which of course is the system that owns the presidency and the presidency is including and most notably i'd say in our most recent sort of de-evolution during the obama presidency he wasn't a president he was working for the machine 
he was part of he was the expression of the machine that everybody now wants to pretend as if you no know, he was the good guy that's the that's antithetical to all things trump the best thing about trump from where i'm sitting is that trump is the ultimate mirror and reflection of what is but what you didn't comment on in your comparison and contrast is all the things that trump is in the midst of but that is also an expression of what the system is getting away with and that's a hugely important aha for those who might support Trump that might not be all in on, you know, fascism or white supremacy or anything else. They just might be white working class that know that they don't have, uh, uh, you know, they don't have somebody representing them and anybody but the system that made their lives hard, they're going to go with. And so therefore they find themselves because people in their churches or maybe people that they see in their jobs and white working class is kind of a shortcut, even though as we have shown you, I have shown you in the last five truth bombs, what, what I did was I deconstructed pensioners. What actually is happening to pension, pensioners that is being puppeteered by private equity and um, asset managers, that is they. That's the system that owns everything. Now, in addition to that, I did another truth bomb that was one of the most brilliant um, female like that's important to say, but it is, I guess, given what the, the scope of this is, a woman researcher, analyst, legal scholar who gives us the introspection of how they, the corporation, in this particular case, things like Walmart and BlackRock and other big, big, big time uh, groups stemming from things that transitioned in the 80s from, um, and I got to think of his name, the former CEO of GE who started this whole sort of- Jack Welch? Jack Welch, Descent into Madness, which is all based on basically, I'd call it, um, you know, um, a piranha capitalism might be one word of one way of describe, describing it. You know, everybody's going to literally just devour everybody and then the, and then they're going to end up devouring themselves is, is kind of the Jack Welch model, to be honest with you. But as she relates to the systemology of being able to do the same thing that I just described that are you know, are happening to pensions, but to women in the workplace. And I'm going to be able to bring more research, more data, more dialogue to everybody who's in the, um, uh, you know, African-American, uh, you know, um, uh, catch all, if you will, just in terms of the numbers that have gotten hit since the great financial crisis and same with Latinx people, uh, really people of color. So what I'm telling you is I've connected the dots between white working class and pensions, women, African Americans, Latino, you know, that might leave out a few groups directly, but that's millions and millions of people that have been devastated by they, which is what you're talking about. And neither Trump or uh, Biden truly, I mean, obviously Biden has a lot more thoughtful approaches, at least it would appear on face, but anybody who understands the system knows that there's tons of contradictions happening actually in reality. I mean, yeah, the, the for example, in the infrastructure, um, uh, in the infrastructure budget, what, what do we call it? The, uh, the what, what was what it was after the CARES Act? What was the big? Oh, yeah, it's uh, the the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. The Inflation and Reduction Act, which gives us a lot of uh, budget for uh, the mechanics of uh, you know rebuilding the grid, rebuilding uh, yeah. you know, new research and development, and all of those types of things. Not to mention infrastructure is where I was going with, but. But yeah, we, we've seen unfolded like I think $1.9 trillion through the Biden administration upside into a lot of great things that are happening in the re renewable. <laughs> but what I continue to, re to reveal to the people is that we have actually had 70 trillion, north of $70 trillion looted from this system for they it was over the span of the last 13 years. And it doesn't end, it gets worse and worse and worse, which again is another truth bomb that I just revealed with Art Wilmarth, who explains to us. What happens if you don't have Glass-Steagall? And then, of course, that leads us to understanding Citizens United, which is how they do what you just described, which is through shadow money and revolving door. And both parties do it. I just say the Republicans are a lot less transparent about it. It's just ultimately pay to play and the lowest uh, ROI return on investment for they are politicians. And by the way, as it turns out, Supreme Court justices. So on that note, here comes your turn. I've rolled out the red carpet for you. We've talked. I apologize that two men are talking over a woman. We certainly don't mean to. But here comes the heart and soul of the Clean New Deal and how everything is connected. Miss Roseanne Raviola-Mile, 
coming straight out of Las Vegas, Nevada via Chicago. Thank you, buddy. Thank you, Patrick and uh, Kevin. See, you never have to worry about talking over me because when I want to say something, you hear me, right? You you hear me. And I just Absolutely. told that I told that to a uh, Clark County commissioner who I asked to do something. He sends me his cell phone number. I've known him for years, never had his cell phone number. And I said, uh, gee, thanks. I said, but you know what? If that park where I feed people ain't open, I ain't going to need no telephone. The park was open, which ties into exactly what I want to share with you and everybody here. Yesterday was my regular day. We call it Solidarity Sunday. And the DSA, the Democratic Socialists of America, a group of young people, a lot of volunteers, they would give hygiene items and clothes and things like that to folks on the west side. They never gave them food. So they invite me, oh, Roseanne, you got to come out. So a year and a half ago, I go out there. And what do I find? They're not giving them any food. I said to them, what the hell is this? You got no, you got no food? Okay, that's going to change. So I start cooking. First week we did it, we had, we served 35 meals. Second time we did it, we doubled that. But the more important point for me was where we were sharing with people, where we were connecting with people. We are on the sidewalk, public sidewalk. Nobody can screw with us at the right in front of the parking lot for a mosque. Okay. I got to meet the folks from the mosque when I start doing this. Some of the kindest, most just loving people I have never, I, I have ever encountered. Yesterday, we talked briefly about one of the young men who recently died. So the imam says to me, you know, I gave him my condolences and I never, I never knew he was a certified dyed in the wool gangster. He was a gangster. I didn't know that. I just knew him as I knew him come up to me, hug me, I hug him, blah, blah, blah. Okay. So the imam is sharing this story with me. And we get to talking about actions. And that's what I'm about. Two things. Sharing. Sharing is an action. Sharing facts and food. The imam says to me, Roseanne, people, people love you. They, they just, they just want to be around you and work with you and hear you. And I say, well, that's really nice. I said, but and, and he was saying the same thing about the gang stuff, okay? Police came to his funeral. Politicians came to his funeral. He was a gangster, okay? Now, how do we get the people from the street who aren't registered to vote, 
who don't vote could give a flying fig about things that we discuss. Nietzsche, hey, when I mean, how do we, how do we, unless I can get in somebody's face, how do I get them to do what it takes to get the independent candidates to come together to elect an independent president. That's what I want. I want people who never voted, people who don't care about voting, people who say don't talk about politics. I want them to come together to do what I know. And I know we believe this. It's possible. What do we do? Imam says to me, Roseanne, it's not only words, it's actions. And what I find on, on X is that I get more people viewing what I put out there when I say, hey, I'm cooking this morning and I put up a, a picture. What are you doing? I get more views when I do that as opposed to when I just say some straight facts. Although, Mr. Patrick, you have been um, knocking it out of the ballpark with the, the views that we're getting on YouTube, okay? And you know, I mean, Art Will Marth, you can't you can't go wrong, Art. Well, let me let me let me chime in here for a second because I want to toss this back to you, Kevin, uh, in a minute. But with this transition, okay. So Roseanne again has always inspired me for a lot of reasons, mostly because she gets it and she got what I did and came together with me and and became my partner in crime and this whole thing because she'd grown up witnessing corruption in Chicago her whole life. It's from the time she was a girl. And it wasn't until she discovered our work, but my work for this uh, kind of, um, you know, in, in terms of what people will relate to. I don't need to go into the background of everybody who was involved with the making of the con, but at the, at the con at www.thecon.tv, what Roseanne saw in that was, oh my God, that completed me. They completed the picture. It was everything that I've kind of intuited my whole life. But here was a project that put it all together, that asked the right questions, that got the evidence, that put all of these pieces together in this Rubik's Cube is the way I always described it, where you're trying to get all of the different pieces to fit and you get all the same sides and you know you've accomplished it when you put it all together. And that's exactly what we did. So what did we do, though? What we what we revealed was the machine and they that Kevin has revealed. So the media writ large is... It's a horse race between the lesser of two evils with a lot of fear that are involved. That's not to suggest that a, there shouldn't be a lot of fear involved. I mean, of course, there should be a lot of fear. We're, we're on the verge of World War III, for Christ's sakes. And World War III, to me, from my vantage, after everything that I've looked at this entirety of the last four or five decades, knowing what I know from 9-11 through 2008, I don't know enough about COVID other than the financial part of it. But ultimately, the bank runs of 2023, uh, which are step and repeat from before, and 99% of the people, particularly those on the street. So like for Roseanne, I got to put this antidote in. You know, again, I'll bring this back. I've been watching in between delivering unbelievable professionals at the highest levels to give us this information that no one else will. You'll never see it on Lawrence O'Donnell. You'll never see it on Rachel Maddow. God there's no chance in hell to see it on Tucker Carlson or Sean Hannity or whomever, but or, or anywhere on CNN. I mean, again, it's just a reactionary horse race of the same thing that we've seen for decades. And everybody knows that. But 
what I see on YouTube because of my algorithms, because of what I do and what I put out there, it does put me into a lot of pieces on fraud. And recently I saw these interviews that one Lex Fridman did on uh, this guy named Matthew Cox, who was the shyster that is incredible in terms of grift and um, um, documentation fraud and theft from the banks through mortgage fraud, where he was targeting really the most vulnerable people that include those people that you're feeding every Sunday. Homeless people are having their identities stolen for people like this guy, Matthew Cox, who are using their identities to steal millions of dollars from the banks. That's legit. Now, in addition to that, I happen to pass across this other cat who was involved with supposedly the largest crypto fraud so far in history, which I was looking at the numbers and they didn't really lay it out if it was bigger than Sam Bankman Freed. But I mean, these guys were doing the same sorts of documentation fraud and setup and theft and all manners of shape or form of Ponzi scheming, just like we've seen since the 20s, that this guy just lays it out straight. And they were two of the same guys in different spaces doing the same type of methodologies, which is a gateway to Trump. OK, all things Trump are reflecting of Matthew Cox and these other ways of scheming and grifting and getting away with appraisal fraud and all of these other bank scenarios. And Trump is just if you follow the path of this two bit huckster on the base level to a guy with crypto on a global scale, that's you know not really any different with the, with the psychology but, you know, just bigger amounts of people that he had access to because of all things crypto. And then you get to Trump and where he fits in the paradigm and everything else. But still, they are playing the system. The system enables this stuff. And why does the system enable this stuff? So we could talk a million ways to Sunday about all the things Biden has gotten wrong. We could talk about a million ways to Sunday about all the things that Trump has gotten wrong. And we could debate that until the cows come home. Meanwhile, the system keeps on keeping on because of what we revealed, what you just teed up, Art Wilmarth particularly, but of course I said with the women and with the with the um, pensioners and with you know African Americans and everybody, white working class, the whole the whole spectrum. I'm trying to pull everybody out of their silos because it's the doom loop. And what is the doom loop? And it's happening again. What we have done since what we revealed in the con, again, at www.thecon.tv, which was the entirety of the 2008 great financial crisis, which wasn't a standalone. It was a connection to everything that happened in the previous 30 years. But the grifters, the racketeers, the cheaters that are at the top of the apex of this thing, which is called our financial system, figured out a way to hijack our government and control the central bank. It's beyond Orwellian. It's beyond Nietzsche. It's beyond James Bond. It's beyond any Orwellian uh, fictional depiction of this stuff that we've had for the last 100, 200 years. And oh yeah, absolute power corrupts absolutely, which is the history of humanity. Okay? So we could go back to the Middle Ages and yada, yada, yada. But now it's on steroids. It's global. And what we show you over and over and over is that the Federal Reserve continues to provide trillions of dollars of liquidity to racketeering enterprises whose entire business model is to basically smash and grab and loot. It's the largest criminal enterprise in history. And the only people this works for is quite frankly, the top 10%, maybe the top 5%, top 1% did okay. The top 001% own the entire system. So going back to what Kevin had said, that's they. And so what we are desperately trying to get people to understand from the bottom, you people, if you ever happen to get this on the street and you've had some hard times, you cannot stick your head in the sand and pretend like that you don't have skin in the game. You're there for a reason. You had a lot of problems that happened along the way, but it was made possible by the system overall. There's a better way to create upward mobility and dynamism and opportunity and fairness across the board. And we could talk about that writ large within the context of the Clean New Deal. But unless and until tens of millions of us are equipped with what Roseanne always says, she comes with the facts and food. And what are those two things? Those are nourishment for your soul and your body and your mind so that you can function as a citizen. To be a citizen, you have to be informed. You have to be active. You cannot allow other people, if you don't, if you want to avoid politics in this country, trust me, the guys who don't want to avoid politics will freaking backside you and destroy you and crush you all day, every day till the cows come home because absolute power 
corrupts absolutely. Anyway, so that you, you you hear me say that all the time. But again, we've had so much more information in the last couple of uh, truth bombs and what you're, you're you're revealing. How do you square, Kevin? You continue to bring us this fifty trillion dollar transfer of wealth from the working middle class to the top one percent, which is a different connotation and a framing of what we're talking about. Why don't you walk through that process so that people understand that aspect of what we're dealing with? Yeah, actually, the, we're talking about two different streams of income. You know, what you identify in the con and in the new untouchables is the theft associated with the Federal Reserve and the U.S. Treasury and 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 control fraud, you know, um, by uh, people who run corporations and particularly banks. Um, the $50 trillion I reference in America's Last Stand is... Um, widely validated economic analysis that looks at how how when we had the most equal economy in American history, the, you know, 1950 to 1980, or 19, let's say 1945 to 1975, how, how, how did we value everyone's contribution to the overall GDP? Well, we valued that by how we distributed income for the work that they did. And that had we maintain the same distribution of income that we used when America was at its greatest, broadest prosperity, you know, 1945, 1975. If we continued that practice, right, what, what you would notice, you know, is that everyone else, the bottom 90% earners in the country would be doing so much better. What, what has happened over the 50, you know, since 1975 all the way up to today is that there has been a systemic intent through the tax code, through international trade policy, through any number of, through the, the, the deployment of technology, automation, you know, what have you, to, you know, through, through breaking up unions, right? You know, all these, all these efforts have systemically allowed uh, the most of the income that all that you know from the productivity that all of us provide to go to the top, and and so the Rand Corporation, one of the most known, recognized corporate you know uh, think tanks and, and organizations, had done an analysis that they quantified. Okay, if we maintained the optimal distribution of income that we had when America's economy was as equal as it's ever been through to today, you see that there's been $50 trillion in income extracted. And that to quantify that would be, just imagine since 1975, every working person in America should be making $1,144 a month, every month. Uh, right, <laughs> right. Now consider that over thirteen thousand dollars a year more than yeah, you right. actually made since nineteen seventy five, and that the accumulation of that is fifty trillion dollars. So this is a different way that people that people's lives have been made infinite. A different long. metric, absolutely. Yeah, and 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 the thing about it is, we are actually much more productive on a on a per person basis than the workers were in nineteen seventy four. So we're producing more and we're getting far less, right? But the but but and, and the, the irony is the people in that point zero zero one percent or whatever, or the people in that one percent and stuff like that, it's not that they're producing so you know you know so so much more that they warrant that redistribution. They've just set up a system. This is part goes back to our discussion on capitalism. They have simply set up a system that they could take more for themselves. Right, you know, they're advancing their own self-interest. They are taking more from themselves, but they're doing it in the subtle ways that we can't see it. But the net effect is we find ourselves 
having a harder and harder and harder time just to get by and therefore taking on more personal debt in order to just stand still, right? Okay, so but wait a second, wait a second, bro. Wait a second, brother, because what you just said is so incredibly important because it's not something we can't see. It's just something that a lot of people can't see because they haven't plugged into what we're giving them. We're plugging in everything that defines exactly what you said. Let me give you just a couple of top shelf analysis here real quick, and then hopefully you can bring that full circle and we'll close out with Roseanne. But okay, the Federal Reserve's actual mandate is to have low inflation and high employment, okay? What we've seen with the jobs reports recently, and I think what most of us know in society is that most people aren't making more money. They're having more jobs to just keep their standard of living to a place they can barely accommodate through what? Debt, okay? This is what we're talking about. This is financialization, okay? But not only is it financialization, a transition into one form of capitalism, industrial capitalism, into financial capitalism, okay? We could call it that, but what I'm telling you is, and I, and I will say this until the ends of the, the end of days, right? That we do not live in a democracy. The integrity of law is not real, and the idea of capitalism is fiction in this stage. Now, everything requires capital, okay? But capitalism also, in its very definition, and what I was raised to understand capitalism is, is risk reward. What is the whole magnitude of lending, of banks, of financialization, of asset managers, of private? It's risk, risk management. There is no risk because of what we're telling you. And what the what the Federal Reserve has done is maintained and hyperinflated the assets, the stocks, and the real estate of those that are the owner class but by socialism for them because, and again, this is my go-to, we're not a democracy. What we are is a corporate fascist state. It is redundant for a reason. Corporations with the board and the board of directors act as an autocracy, and it's supposedly for the um, upside for the owners, the shareholders, but ask any corporation if the shareholders are voting for Jamie Dimon after he's had five, you know, massive uh, uh, racketeering against him. They're not even asked. The, the stock's going through the roof because of more and more fraud on each occasion of the course of the last 13 years. Why? Because he's a guarantee to the freaking Fed. If you hear what Jamie Dimon is saying right now, the only threat to the economy is quantitative tightening. Okay, so we'll get into that downstream. That means that the Fed's not buying all of the assets from the banks that are actually securitizing all of this fictional product that's going to the hands of this many people, which they've done over and over and over. But the, the flip side of this is the most important. It's a corporate fascist state undergirded based on what we show you in the con, a criminal syndicate. The financial system and the zombie, com uh, zombie companies that have been propped up since 2009 are the mafiocracy. It's a corporate fascist state undergirded by a criminal syndicate. There's a way that incentives through control fraud and lying, stealing, and cheating and deceiving, aka what the government is demonstrating that Donald Trump is guilty of in the civil fraud trial and everything else. Okay. So if you think Donald Trump's the only guy doing this, and oh yeah, because of one of the truth bombs we did recently, the media is it doesn't even know why Donald Trump was doing it and who, who was complicit actor in it. Donald Trump wasn't getting one over on the banks. It was the bank's methodology through control fraud who were getting their upside by allowing Trump to hyperinflate his assets. That was the scheme that's called control fraud. And media doesn't understand it. This is what we're telling you. So it's a corporate fascist system undergirded by a criminal syndicate that uses socialism, the full faith and credit of the United States as the lender of last resort through the Federal Reserve to the financial dealer brokers that can control all assets by which you've introduced to us through David Webb based on the uh, the nature of uh, um, uh, the UCC-8, but more importantly, in what we call safe harbor. That's another discussion where they own everything. So there are a lot of people out there who take out a lot of debt, call themselves homeowners. And I'll give you, a, well, let me just finish the thought. Not only is it, it it's socialism, so we've given them 10 trillions of dollars to a unified few 
for lying, stealing, and deceiving, creating this mythical freaking economy that everybody's hanging on by their fingertips while the top 001% are extracting tens of trillions, which is tyranny, and now they're fueling fascism. Because the reaction on the far right is like, okay, we got to take everybody out, right? But they're going to start with punching sideways and all the stuff that they traditionally do. But what they're not seeing, like we're seeing on the Texas border, you know, we're going to go after immigrants because they're going to take our jobs. Meanwhile, 50 years of our system have outsourced jobs and offshore profits to where these guys, and by the way, big ag, who do you think is employing all of the, the immigrants? It's the freaking corporate agriculture that's tied to this behemoth. Okay. So again, corruption burrs and fuels fascism because we don't have a democracy. We don't have free markets. We don't have um, the law, which makes it all possible which is what we have to deliver with the clean new deal, which we're going to do twofold. And I'm going to give it to you guys to close us out. The twofold, as far as I'm concerned, it's actually, a, it's a, it's a th three-legged rhetorical stool. You got to have the facts, which is the food and knowledge of your intellect and insight to understand exactly what the United States has become. This didn't happen overnight. This is a 50 years march to this madness that's gotten completely out of hand because media the fourth estate who's supposed to hold power to account got bought by the institutions you're talking about. So we are the only free voice that has the courage to stand on top of the mountain, to look at all the, you know, uh, uh, insanity and chicanery down below to tell you what the truth is, to have you elevate to the mountaintops with us. Because once we get the tens of millions on board, as we're pushing this boulder on our backs backwards to the top of Everest, once everybody gets there with us, because we get tens of millions of people pushing that tr truth up to the top of the mountaintop with this, then we push it off the other side and it becomes this avalanche, this momentum, this critical mass of truth that's like a giant bowling golf ball going to wipe out the bowling pins of, of deception and betrayal, which is this system. And we can only do that through this notion of the clean new deal because we're going to bring the facts to the world. We're going to try to hold the system accountable through the, the vestiges of democracies that still exist, which is Congress to get the insight to do what the government failed to do um, on Wall Street while they're demonstrating it's okay to do about Trump, okay? So that's first and foremost. But we've got to do it through a presidential candidate who is not owned by the system, who can use the office of the presidency to manufacture the investigation, You'll use the bullet pulpit to foment this information until the American people can catch up to where we can catalyze what may downstream become a party. But the bottom line, guys, going back to what um, Kevin said at the very beginning, we've got existential threats in every direction. Man's ability to live on this planet is first and foremost. And if you don't care about what happens to your great grandchildren downstream, shame on you um, for those of you who are religious. We hope that you feel some heat for that downstream. <laughs> for, for, for those of you who believe in free market economies, the greatest growth engine in the history of the world, quite frankly, would be a transition of $70 trillion to the tyranny to $70 trillion to a vibrant economy. Now, we can talk about socialism. We can talk about capitalism. We already have a hybrid version of both. There's a lot of ways we can do this with the details. But the bottom line is you need to be aware, people, of what $70 trillion has already gone to through corporate fascism undergirded by a criminal syndicate that uses socialism to fuel and, you know, uh, to fuel fascism. Roseanne. We have to. The money. You know, I call them the big boys, the zero zero one percent. You take away their money. How do you do that? We know the Fed not only stokes their engines, but gives them bonus points, rewards them for being freaking criminals. So, by the way, the regulators also at the Fed, which we knew were on high, they had the capacity to rein this all in and they chose not to. And they don't, and they don't, and they don't, okay? So it ain't rocket science. It's all racketeering. It's all racketeering. And they, why would you stop? 
Why would you want the Fed to stop showering you with money? Why? They don't, they, they ain't going to do it. We got to do it. The imam says to me yesterday, it's got to be us. It's got to be the people. It's got to be those in the street without a whole hell of a lot of means. It's got to be us all coming together because we can. We can do this. So we have to understand. We have to get the blueprint, the con, the Patrick Lovell truth bombs, the con, the new untouchables. We get the facts to nourish the mind. And when there are many people who go out there to nourish people with food, when they go out to nourish with food, they hand them the facts. And one of my young people was actually, she's like impressed with the card I give her. It's got your picture on the front and it's got my information on the back, Patrick. Okay. And it's got the, it's got the bit.ly uh, link so they can go to our YouTube channel. She is organizing people to run for office. And I say to her, I will come and speak to your people. I will tell them what I know technically can win an election. I stand by 50 volunteers for every 10 thousand voters you get 50 people like us out there knocking on the doors for every 10,000 voters in your district you're gonna win you're gonna win you're gonna beat the money I've seen it happen it can happen it's got to be one with nutrition for the mind and for the body. I, lo I love it, Roseanne. I'm going to, I'm going to just transfer it to you to close this out, Kevin, but I want to, I want to create this transition. Hopefully it's not going to take me more than a minute. So look, I'm surrounded. We all are with everything we're talking about all the day in real time. Okay. And so like recently where I live, uh, we just had the Sundance film festival and I lived in the town where that hosts the Sundance film festival for the last 23 years. And I've had my fingers in there for, or a presence in there for 40 years, going back to my parents and, and what this whole thing means, right? And for me on a personal level. So um, here we are at this celebration of independence, the spirit of courage of filmmakers to, to, to have insight and to connect with people all across the board. And it achieves that in a lot of ways. But the one way it doesn't achieve it is it doesn't tell these stories anymore. The last story that it actually told of giant financial racketeering to this level and maybe they think this is all they never needed to do it was about 11 years ago it was a film called inside job that was narrated by um you know matt damon and it won an academy award and it was brilliant but as i've said in many of my truth bombs it was one piece of it and it got the wrong analogy because or the, the wrong ending because it was early to the table and it didn't see what we've seen over the course of the last 13 years sidebar interestingly enough the guy ferguson who wrote the movie or excuse me made the movie he had a kind of a, what do we call it when, um, you, you know, when it, it'll come back to me, but he wrote a book called Predator Nation about two years later that went silent, that described almost everything that I'm describing to you, but not with as much detail, but it was amazing how he realized that he actually didn't get it right. And so completely right. So he just, he was motivated to write a book about it, but that didn't get through the system because the system can't let you know. So here's a real time mirror of how this whole thing works, right? So three years ago, I get crushed by what happened during COVID, okay? And what happened during COVID was exactly what happened in 2008, okay? What exactly happened in 2008? The financial system went bankrupt, okay? In fact, the banks and the asset managers, private equity, they couldn't operate a day 
without the socialism of the fuel that I'm talking about. So they change the interest rates, they, 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 they uh, hike up the um, liquidity, tens of trillions of dollars more, and it goes to the system. That's the they that we're talking about. But this is how it translated in real time. So when you go into Park City and you're on your way to Main Street, you um, you go down this road that's called Highway 224, but it's just a neighborhood. And it goes right into what Main Street is because it's surrounded by mountains and everything. They had basically demolished the entirety of this town that was basically lived in by people that had been rather low income people that work on the mountains, that work in the bars, that work in the service industry and the hotels and everything else. And young people come and they they work in the uh, in the places to uh, you know facilitate the infrastructure, right? But what happened because of the low interest rates and because of the tens of trillions of dollars in, in, in liquidity to the same people that blew up the world in 2008, what they did like a bulldozer, like Gaza, they come in, they knock everything down, they basically kick out the working class and they just made houses that are tens, well, somewhere between five and $10 million, okay? On this place where the working class once stood and it has been all in the last three years, okay? And I've seen on social media, all the people that I used to know that worked in those areas complaining that they got kicked out of Park City, they couldn't li afford to live there anymore. You know, some people own their houses and they made a lot of money, but whatever. If you make a lot of money and you can't afford a place to live, you've got to relocate. These are the types of things that have happened as a result of this insane theft that has completely controlled everything this country is supposed to be that now is completely above the law. Most of the stuff is all based on fraud. <laughs> and ultimately the people that rebuilt these houses and everything else, the developers who rebuilt these houses, the banks that lend it, they don't lose any money because they just packaged it up in securities, sold it right back to the Fed. So they got free money from the Fed to do this, to kick out the working class, and then they basically had all the upside because the Fed was buying through what we call quantitative easing, all of the uh, securities that were packaged by the banks. So what say you, Kevin, to close us out? What I would say to the listeners is this. You, the way you make your vote count, the way you make your vote make a difference is not giving it to the duopoly, to the establishment parties. You give it to them and you're going to get what we've been getting, which none of us want. So if you want to make a difference with your vote, let's come together. We need 80 million of us, 80 million of us, all of which are, have, are in the same boat where we're on the short end of this stick. We give that to an independent who's not owned by wealth, right? Who is acting on our behalf. Then we will have power at the table. Then we will be able to, to make a difference in our lives. Then we will be able to reclaim our sovereignty. So I encourage you to get educated on how we got in this spot. A great start is, is going to the con, www.thecon.tv, and, and to get yourself educated on what's going on. And then join us so that we can convince the independents and the third parties who are trying to also get, get, a, get power at the table to come together, come together this summer so that we could put the best, most credible, presidential ticket together to challenge both President Biden and former President Trump. We can do this. I love it. And uh, there's going to be more detail to come. But um, one of the things that I had said at the outset of this is that one of my truth bombs recently em emphasized the importance of re um, recreating a new Glass-Steagall Act. So that is part of the Clean New Deal. We have to do a Glass-Steagall Act now. What is Glass-Steagall? You got to separate commercial banking from speculative uh, investment banking because that's what this is all about. This is taking outsized risk with other people's money using fraud to do it. That's the whole system. So you have to have a new Glass-Steagall. The flip side of that is we've got to get rid of Citizens United. Citizens United said that uh, speech is money. And quite frankly, what they're telling you, America, is that unless you have skin in the game, you have no voice. So what you're looked at, what you're looking at, if you're not the top 001% that spends billions to get the economy that serves them, which is called tyranny. And by the way, I'll reemphasize what I reemphasize all the time, which is billionaires spend billions to loot trillions 
it's they're they're stealing from you and it's all this incredible shell game of a facade it's deception and it's betrayal okay but they use thousands and thousands of professionals in the financial system and the um and uh you know attorneys as well as accountants and then ultimately you know in the revolving door of government okay so that's they've got a complete control of the situation so in light of that if you agree with this if you understand that a i delivered you that we spent four and a half million dollars to get the con to you which delivers a 70 trillion dollar truth quite an incredible roi if only americans didn't just buy lies and started buying the truth and if you decided well what these guys are talking about really resonates with me and oh my god here's a people's movement that's going to fight the corruption that everybody's putting their heads in the sand and going crazy because we're all being fractured as a result of this and if you recognize that we're all in silos that if we come out of the silos, it's just simple. If you believe in liberty and justice for all, if you believe in the integrity of law, if you believe in separation of powers, if you have any understanding of the Bill of Rights and um, you know the Constitution, but ultimately the wars that got us to the point where everybody had a peace, where everybody could uh, participate in the vote, where we had options, you've got to realize that everything that made all of those wars inevitable and necessary, they're right back at us again. And so we're going to ultimately have it with the climate problem on top of it, okay, which is a whole nother band of survivability. Everything is on the line. What we're asking you to consider is to invest, contribute, get involved with a $13 contribution to help us build this movement, because without investment, there's no way we can get organized to the level that we need to get organized to fight this machine. And if I put the low end of people that got killed, destroyed, butchered, whatever, uh, in the 2008 great financial crisis, we know that's north of 100 million. If we could galvanize 13 million people at $13, that's $169 million. We can do this. You can do this. We've already done it. We just have to connect. That's my message to you. Failure is not an option. Rise, war, revolt. It's not rocket science. It's racketeering. This is the righteous grind, all in service to the new clean deal, onwards and upwards.